Judy Stiles. Welcome to Newsmakers. It's the time of year for our annual year in review program. Each week this year, I've had a variety of guests covering many topics of local interest. Today, we'll highlight a few of those topics. As we end 2019, we head toward a national election year. However, 2019 was a year when we had a couple of local elections. One dealt with a proposal by Jasper County for a new Joplin Courthouse, changes to the Carthage Courthouse, and the jail. We also had an election looking at police and fire pensions in Joplin. Here are ex excerpts from those programs. We have purchased land for Station 7 um, sometime in, in the next two to three years. We hope to start uh, construction of Station 7. And yeah, I mean, this this initiative could be huge in, in what type of in, uh, person we're able to hire for that, that station. Right. Well, Chief, on the police side, I know that we've talked in the past about staffing and mm -hmm. kind of go, the ups and downs and so forth. Yes. If someone were to ask you, how does the Joplin Police Department stand now as far as staffing? So as far as staffing goes, we are in a much better position today than we were a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, about a year ago, we had uh, almost 19, 20 vacancies uh, within our agency, and as of today, we have seven vacancies. Uh, like Chief Ferguson said, even even though we've we've filled some of those vacancies, it takes several years to fill that experience right. uh, that we lost. And so we're, we're still a few years uh, down the road in needing to actually being able to fill that experience and that talent uh, that, that we lost. However, uh, with the hope of this uh, proposition is that we'll be able to retain that experience. Because uh, like Chief Ferguson said, when you're, when you're sending an officer out on a domestic or on a burglary call or something like that, then being able to draw back on their experience that they have and be able to handle that call effectively is huge. Mm -hmm. Now Terry, you mentioned from the citizen's perspective and a lot of people when they see a tax issue they're wondering well what's going to cost but the, the benefits. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the benefits of mm -hmm. retaining people, the safety of our community. And actually over over these years of funding this transition uh, will actually save money. Mm -hmm. The city will actually save money. So by putting into the new plan, you're saving the money that you're spending today yes. on those yes. plans. Yes, absolutely, yeah. and, absolutely. And yeah. of course, when we talk about taxes, people want to know, well, okay, half mm -hmm. cent, how does that work out to what mm -hmm. we're paying? I think we also have a graphic that kind of mm -hmm. compares maybe to other communities. Because people, you may not realize until you check out how much tax you're paying mm -hmm. on things oftentimes. Right, right. So yeah, so basically, uh, it's a half cent sales tax. Mm -hmm. And so for a $100 purchase, uh, you're, you're paying an additional 50 cents. And so, uh, you know, that that's a pretty small amount when you look at the uh, bigger picture. And I know a lot of people are uh, not always in favor of, of more taxes, uh, but a couple of the benefits with this is, one, it, it'll be last no longer than 12 years. And then if the pension becomes funded at, at 120%, before then, uh, then that tax will drop off even before those that 12 years ends. And so, yeah. So the benefit of it is, uh, it, it is a just for a specific amount of time. Some of those taxes it goes on forever, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a, a defined amount of time when this tax will be in place. And we have a graphic on the screen mm -hmm. that kind of compares Joplin to some of the other communities. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if you look at what the current tax is uh, compared to what uh, some of these other communities are, you'll see that we're really at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, what our sales tax is and so what the proposed levels obviously Joplin sits in two different counties right uh, the vast majority of Joplin is in Jasper County with everything that's south of 32nd Street being in Newton County and so to show you what the new tax will be and that really puts us more in the middle uh, of these other communities as far as what our sales tax base will be mm -hmm. and you know Terry mentioned the savings I think uh, it's been projected over a 20-year period if this were to successfully be passed, that it would save the taxpayers over $28 million in that 20 year period. Mm -hmm. So so um, from the city perspective, that's $28 million for other uses that you could use the funds? Or you be able to know where the city it decides would certainly to do so, yeah. Yes. Tying those yes. together for Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. working that out. So uh, other communities have had proposals like this. <coughs> so can you think of other communities where the citizens have been asked for a sales tax to support this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think most recently uh, Springfield uh, has gone through this. They, mm -hmm. they had a tax initiative, um, I don't remember how many years ago, but it was it was pretty short time ago uh, where they, were, they went through the almost the identical thing thing. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between Joplin and Springfield. There's, mm -hmm. there's also some differences between the two cities. Uh, but there's a lot of similarities. And some other cities, uh, St. Joseph, Missouri mm -hmm. is, has gone through the same thing. Kansas City is getting ready to have to address their pension issues. And what we've seen is there's several different cities, both St. Louis and Kansas City area, as well as, as, well as other places in Missouri where their, their pension is just becoming too much of a burden on the city as a whole. And so they're having to look at different ways uh, 
to fund the pension. That's exactly what we're doing here is our, our current pension system has just become such a burden on the city financially. Uh, that we've come to this as a way to move from our local pension mm -hmm. to the state-funded pension. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's even uh, quite a few benefits that our folks will see by moving to this uh, state-funded pension plan. Voters approved both of those proposals. Another area receiving a lot of attention in 2019 was the local arts and cultural scene. We found out about a cultural arts district in Joplin and concert series. We also found out about plans for an arts complex in downtown Joplin in April and followed up in October. Here's a little bit of that interview from October. Right. Well, getting that going, and that's a challenge, I know, you're continuing to work on that, but you've had a lot of input from the community in this pro whole project from the beginning. Yes, from the very beginning, I mean, back in even what was it, 2008? 2008, 2009, we've just, it's <laughs> more. <morphed. laughs> you know. And then we continue asking people for their input, you know, I feel like right. every couple of years, because mm -hmm. the as the plans change and people change in the organizations, right. you have to continuously educate and ask what the needs are now, so. New technology comes future. along, I'm sure, that even mm -hmm. affecting the design in the last 10 or 11 years. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, and, it's, and we're going to do our very best to bring the absolute best of technology the absolute best of sound, mm -hmm. lighting, uh, you know, the design so that um, we, you know, keep the sound encapsulated where it needs to be and sound outside where it needs to be. So we're really trying to do our absolute best to make this the optimum arts, culture, and entertainment um, location for Joplin. Great. Of course, this is a massive project you've been working on, but you have some ongoing projects and something that uh, solved curtains up from series and that's yes. happening right now so mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about that and what yeah. that involves. Yeah so we began the curtains up series in fall of 2017 mm -hmm. um, definitely before we can have the Cornell complex and these you know a 450 seat theater and a 1500 seat amphitheater to program regularly since it will be Connect to Culture's home um, we decided we need to build our performing arts muscle and so we started the curtains up series we had um, three performances in the first year and then we grew it to five and then this season we're having four um, so we have a great lineup of ballet we have a Christmas show we have um, we have acapella and we also have uh, kind of a musical theatrical Irish pub situation going on mm -hmm. so um, the first one up is Ailey 2 and that's this month October 29th mm -hmm. it's a Tuesday night at 7 30 p.m. at Joplin High School Performing Arts Center and this is the world-renowned Alvin Ailey um, Dance Theater out of New York City this is their junior company and it's just going to be phenomenal. We've never, this is kind of new for us. Yes. We're excited. It's the yes. first time you've had this type of performance. First time <laughs> we've had this genre, and that's, that's one of the things. We want to bring as much diversity as we can, and exactly, this mm -hmm. is the first time for a dance uh, genre and bringing a group that is pre, as premier as they are, as world renowned as they are from New York City. This is a great opportunity for our dance community and for patrons who maybe never experienced dance but mm -hmm. want to come see what it's about. The, this will be an amazing performance. Great. So we start off in October and then you kind of space out a couple of yes. months from there? Yeah, then we go to our Christmas show, which is David Phelps, It Must Be Christmas. And we had him um, in December of two years ago. Yep, so. two years ago. And he sold out. So we were like, we definitely want David to come back. back. <laughs> Everyone had such a great time. It's uh, Sunday, December 15th, 7.30 p.m., also at the Joplin High School Performing Arts Center. Okay. So then the first of the year rolls around, you're back in February with another performance. Yes, right. In mm -hmm. February, we welcome acapella. This is also pretty new to us, acapellas as well. Mm -hmm. um, Voctive is a group that got their start in Epcot at Disney, and they all met each other and began Voctive. Um, they'll be on Sunday, February 2nd mm -hmm. at 7.30 p.m., also at Joplin High School. Um, they've worked with other groups such as Pentatonix that people have probably heard of. They've done a Disney medley with one of their singers and pentatonic so really excited about that very Good. family oriented mm -hmm. as they as they market themselves from Broadway to Disney just a great sound of evening entertainment so mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be a wonderful time of just high quality voices that will just stir 
Another form of entertainment, sports, was also highlighted on Newsmakers. In January, our students caught up with the St. Louis Cardinals baseball players when they came to town for the annual caravan visit. One of those players, Jack Flaherty, spoke before he had a very impressive season. I took a few weeks off and went to, uh, went to Mexico and took a little vacation, first one I've taken in years, and then uh, it's just been hard at work, been hard at work uh, getting ready for this year. Yeah, baseball's one of the longest seasons out there, so you know, you got to be real prepared. Uh, what did you do to improve your game this offseason? Uh, I mean, I'm just focusing on, on moving my body more efficiently and in better ways and uh, you know, looking back on last year and taking what I learned and being able to apply it to this year and uh, just you know, been working on moving forward. So what's your favorite thing about this Cardinal Caravan? Uh, man, getting to see everybody, getting, the, getting to see the fans, getting to see the excitement, knowing that everybody's ready for the season to start, and it really gets us ready. You know, it, it's about the time where things really start picking up for us when it comes to training, and so, but getting out here, seeing everybody like this, it, it's fun. So what's your, like, it was your rookie season last year, right? Yeah. All right, so what was your favorite part of that? Ah, uh, man, um... Just the just the whole season. I, I don't know if I can pick one part. I think going you know going back to LA for me was 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 great. Just getting to go home and be back in that stadium. Um, but just the day in day out and being able to be around these guys and building those relationships with everybody. Uh, that, that that's gotta that, that was something that just it was fun. It was a great first year, and I'm looking forward to this next one. So you get to you know throw the ball to one of the best catchers you know in St. Louis Cardinals history, maybe even in the MLB. So what's it like pitching to Yachty? Uh, I mean, it's 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 nerve wracking at first because you know you know he's one of the best like to ever do it, not just in Cardinals history, you know, in baseball history, and then uh, but developing that relationship with him and, and getting with him and, and throwing to him and getting more comfortable has just been it's been fun, it's been special, and uh, you know I I'm just I'm happy to be able to to be able to throw to that guy. A player who pitched from the bullpen last year was Dominic Leone. He finished the season with four scoreless appearances. Shay Schrader talked to him about the caravan and his goals. I think cool. I mean, you get to see the widespread support that we get, and you know it's much appreciated. And and you know it's nice to just you know put some uh, names and faces of, of people that you know are constantly rooting us on. Awesome. Um, Joplin is, like I said, the most western part of Cardinal Nation, which as a whole stretches into five other states. Uh, outside Missouri, there's Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee. Before you were traded to the Cardinals last year, you played in Toronto, Seattle, and Arizona organizations. Um, are you surprised at how large St. Louis's fan base is compared to other teams? Uh, definitely. I mean, they travel well. I mean, every park we go to, you see a bunch of red, and it, it's nice. And it, it makes it uh, makes it homely. You know, you, you feel like you're never away from uh, from Bush Stadium. So, it, it is nice to have that widespread uh, support. Um, now, I know injuries limited your debut last season with the Cardinals. Um, tell us where you're at as far as health concerned. Are you at 100 percent? Oh, I'm good to go. Yeah, I'm 100 percent. Can't wait for spring training. So, uh, hopefully, we'll be out there for a full season this year. And you're being looked at as a very important piece of the 2019 bullpen, obviously. Uh, with the addition of Andrew Miller this year and Jordan Hicks last year, do you think the bullpen will be improved over last year? Uh, for sure. You know, I think everybody will have an extra year of experience, and we got a ton of great arms down there. Like you said, the, the addition of Andrew is, is a big thing for us, and I think Jordan is going to uh, you know, just take off and, and, and really take off from where he, where he left off last year. So um, it's going to be good. We're, we're going to be a strong group. Have any playoff hopes for this season? Oh, of course, every year. You know, that's the goal. Um, you know, and, and we really want to uh, do it for not only for the city of St. Louis, but all the, the widespread fans that are, that are all over the place. And um, finally, with the addition of both Miller and new first baseman Carl Goldschmidt to the team, do you think you guys have closed the gap with the Chicago Cubs? Oh, Definitely. You know, and Milwaukee Brewers. As yeah, well. yeah, definitely. I mean, those guys, like I said, they're they're huge. They're huge impact uh, players, and I think it just gives us another leg up and another weapon that uh, you know we're obviously going to use uh, within division. We now turn to another topic: economic development. In the spring, I visited with the new Joplin Chamber director, Toby Teeter. Community to define what we are and, and develop a brand and some themes around that brand and then market our community not only to uh, uh, people that are, aren't familiar with Joplin but grew up here. There's a lot of people that grew up here, left Joplin and don't realize how far Joplin has came in the last 5 to 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time to reintroduce the new Joplin. Bring them back. And of course you have programs for some of the younger professionals in the community already through the chamber. They're trying to encourage the 20-somethings the that you mentioned, right. you know, try to encourage their careers. Uh, so we have 
a young professional network. Mm -hmm. uh, it's for, for under 40 professionals. Um, if your employer is a chamber member, uh, you have a discounted membership to YPN, but you still mm -hmm. have eligibility to join YPN even though your employer is not a chamber mm -hmm. member. Mm -hmm. And that they have, uh, have all kinds of opportunities. The, the important part for YPN is they're trying to develop a path of leadership uh, and create uh, civic-minded uh, young professionals. Right. So there's social opportunities and there's actually opportunities to lead work groups and do different initiatives. One of their initiatives actually is connectivity. Mm -hmm. Trails uh, and um, kind of cycling and, and walkable streets. And, and so that's an example of a work group where they meet regularly to affect change. To try to say what can we do, what are some possibilities yes. in piecing this together. And you even have programs for high school students. So I'm talking about working with the youngsters, the people who haven't even started their college career or work career yet. Yeah, a, a long-standing program the Chamber initiated is uh, tomorrow leaders today. Mm -hmm. It is for high school seniors. Uh, they apply to join this program. If accepted, there's a, a year long, uh, school year long program right. where they go around and learn about different aspects of our community, different sectors. We have Manufacturing Day, we have Public Policy Day, uh, we have opportunity uh, to go to City Hall, understand how city uh, the works, uh, and they even go to Jeff City and meet with uh, the delegation there. So they're getting a good education about Joplin and what's involved to make things happen in the business world. Uh, Absolutely, right. and then when they go off to college, where they stay here or go mm -hmm. on, the idea is is to um, better understand uh, not only how our community ticks, but what what we have to offer as far as how diverse and, and how much opportunity there is here. So, if they go off, hopefully they'll come back home. Come back and say, I'm going to take my job and bring it back in yes. and work there. And then leadership Joplin is something we've heard about throughout the years. And so leadership Joplin is a program that is annual. Mm -hmm. There is a class of about 30 to 40 professionals. Right. Um, they start in January and they graduate in June mm -hmm. and uh, they too it, it's 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 about uh, professional development uh, typically they're younger professionals uh, typically a lot of the employers will actually scholarship uh, their participation mm -hmm. and 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 likewise uh, they they work together as a class and do uh, different things within the community and they learn about different aspects of our community and those class over time get they get really close because they're and together each, all those each, professions, right? each gra graduating leadership job Joplin class really uh, stays networked throughout their lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, there's actually hundreds and hundreds of leadership Joplin graduates and alumni in our in our community who are working in those different positions throughout yes. the community and tying yep. that together. Use the word networking. That sounds like that's a big key for the chambers. People getting to know others. It's not just I'm a member. I show up for these little events and I leave. You know. <laughs> that's true. Another aspect of the chamber involvement is is networking. It's 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 uh, the chamber works hard to create the venue to uh, affect transactional relationships. Relationships, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're selling a product or service or looking for a new job, there's an opportunity uh, within the chamber to network with your community and understand, um, you know, what's going on. All right. Well, going back to your work as an entrepreneur, working in Joplin, you mentioned, you know, working with the innovative ideas and so forth. Is that a big part as far as having some mentors or peers that people can work with when they're starting off with those uh, incubator ideas, starting things? So there's a there's a couple of new initiatives that we're working on. Uh, one is mentorships. We're looking at assembling what I'm calling uh, entrepreneurs and residents, mm -hmm. uh, existing successful entrepreneurs that understand everything from raising funds to all the struggles has to do with starting up a new business right. and we're working on actually creating a, a staff of entrepreneurs and residents mm -hmm. that will be able to service local startups. Uh, another area of mentorship is we're also looking to assemble uh, executives and residents. We have a lot of actually area CEOs that have recently retired in the last mm -hmm. few years and we're re-engaging uh, those individuals and getting them to enter men mentorship relationships. News from Missouri Southern was also featured on Newsmakers in 2019. In the spring, I met the first graduate from the current campus, Barbara Bevins, and a faculty member who was her advisor, Dr. Conrad Gubera. Doesn't seem like it's been that long. There you go. Seems like it was just yesterday. And Dr. Gubera, 50 years of seeing students walk across the stage with their baccalaureate degrees. Mm -hmm. It uh, seems to have gone awfully fast. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, in my comments, before I introduce Barbara, I'm going to uh, invite this class of 2019 to come back for the 2069 graduation <laughs> Great. and see how many will muster up to the call. Great. Well, a lot of people are probably curious, you know, we know Missouri Southern has changed tremendously in 50 years and, you know, going from junior college to college to university, but help me picture what it was like at 50 years ago at the graduation ceremony. How many graduates, where it was held, you know, kind of paint the picture for us between the two of you. I don't know how many. I've got all that data. Okay. How so many graduates? So what do you remember, though? I remember 
like most graduates, getting it over with. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get through the ceremony. <laughs> I just remember going across the stage. That's and, funny. And. Um, but it you were the a, first. It was, it was, I was the first. My name started with a B. I got mm -hmm. a Bachelor of Arts. So you were the first person to walk over, shake hands, and pick up that diploma. I was, and I attribute that to the fact that I like to eat my dessert last. So <laughs> as a freshman and a uh, sophomore, I took the required classes. And it also helps you if you don't know what you want to do in life. It gives mm -hmm. you a chance to get the basics and then later move into what you want to do. So for today's and students, we're talking about like take your core classes. And take your core classes at the beginning. <clears throat> and of course, I finished in four years, which <laughs> is something we don't hear about today. challenge today, today right? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I worked part time. While you were going to school? This was such a small campus, they didn't have any dormitories, so mm -hmm. it, we called it kind of a suitcase college. You lived at home, you had an apartment, you commuted to and from. Mm -hmm. What about the ceremony itself, Dr. Gobert? Where well, was it held? Um, what's happening? There were 198 graduates, mm -hmm. okay. and they represented a student body of between 1800 and 1900 all of whom lived off campus because we didn't have any dormitories. So they hadn't in. built so any residential facilities. She was Nothing. right. Mm -hmm. It was truly a suitcase kind of campus. And uh, Barbara was the first in line. They announced that she was getting a degree in sociology. So I always think of sociology as being, for instance, the, um, the leading uh, degree on the campus. First the first major. The first major. But we're going to add to that. You know, I mentioned tomorrow in my comments introducing Barbara that uh, probably about, oh, uh, a fourth or a fifth of the class will probably be non-traditional students tomorrow that get their degree. And everybody in Barbara's class were traditional students, the exception of maybe one person that I'm going mm -hmm. to draw attention to. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were all, for the most part, the vast majority of them were first gens. And they were the first generation first in their family mm -hmm. to get a degree. I know Barbara was and all of them that I knew, for instance, you know. Today, from my evaluations of students in my class, extrapolating that to the largest student body of 6,000, and we'll have 780 graduates uh, this spring and 300 and some last winter, as I recall, right. in December. Wow. So we'll graduate about 11 to 1,200. And as a result, uh, you know, today probably about 20% are first gens. Everybody else has at least one parent or both that have a college education. And that mm -hmm. shows up in the way they are as students and their ability to think, write, access. I mean, these kids today are pretty darn good they and they're prepare. pretty <laughs> sharp, you know. And Barbara's uh, group just didn't have that kind of background, obviously. Mm -hmm. You came from a high school in Golden City, as I recall, see? I continued the tradition of interviewing retiring faculty and staff members at Missouri Southern from a variety of departments on campus. I also had the opportunity to visit with Southern's president, Dr. Alan Marble, who announced his plans to retire at the end of the current academic year. I really feel pretty pretty good about the year. Um, we have a great, great bunch of students on campus. We have uh, great faculty and staff, and um, all the rain has made the, the campus just green, uh, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. It's a really a beautiful looking campus and a lot of activity happening. A lot of activity. activity. Like that, yeah. Well, this year was a year when you made a big announcement, so I want to, a lot of people are probably curious about that. So I'll start out at the beginning as far as you're planning to retire at the end of this year. Planning to retire, you bet. Um, be 65 years old in January. and. Um, Got a new grandbaby right. and other things too that I should probably be doing. Um, but this has been a great time here it's, and this will be a great year. I think this is going to be another great year. Um, but it's time to, to move on I think and uh, get into retirement. Right. Everybody reaches that point in their life where they say That's what's happening next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. When you look back at six or so years here at Missouri Southern, what stands out in your mind as far as? I, you know, what stands out are the people, the, the students and the faculty and staff, the just wonderful people here. And yeah, together, they've been able to create what I've called magic before, and I think it is magic. It's just been a magical experience and one that I've been uh, greatly honored to be a part of. And there's been a number of accomplishments over those years, and I know one of the, not a very minor one, is just the reaccreditation, having that recognition by a national organization. Well, really, I, you know, I, truthfully, that's the last box I felt like needed to be checked before mm -hmm. I could, you know, retire. Mm -hmm. uh, I told the board years ago that I, did, I really didn't plan to work past 65, mm -hmm. uh, but we had the site visit coming in February, and um, we needed to show stability and get through that, and, you know, um, 
the faculty, staff, and students did such a great job impressing the uh, the site visit team that we got a complimentary letter. It was it was just great. Uh, so I knew then that I was you know released to go, but didn't want to tell anyone. Uh, didn't want to leak out. Told ask the board please to keep it quiet until I could talk to the faculty and staff. Um, Face to face. Right. It's kind of the way we do things. Yeah. And then open discussion has been a trait of what you've had encouraged here at Missouri Southern. Yeah, I think that's uh, the best way to operate. It's just been uh, my uh, style, and it's what seems to work best is that, you know, if you have open discussion, tell the truth, then you really don't have to remember what you've said. <laughs> right. And also, guys, people feel like they're involved. It's one of the things that I know that you've stressed while you've been here is people are involved in everything that goes on. Well, when people are involved, then, you know, they don't just do what they're told to do, they do what they believe they can do. And so you don't have to follow people around all the time. They're just doing this, these magical things all over the place. And um, that's something I'm very proud of is that people feel uh, empowered to do the things that they need to do to be successful in their jobs. We've seen kind of a transition from you know the financial side of open book management and so forth to now other aspects of Missouri Southern. That's right, we have. We've hit stage two. You know, we, we started with, uh, we didn't have a choice. The, you know, the financial situation was very, was dire. So we had to address that first and have successfully, we're, we're, we're stable financially now and doing well. Uh, so we should turn to our regular business and that business is academics and that's where we're headed now so the metrics now will be we will check in the, the academic performance and uh, what, what, what can we do to provide um, a better learning experience for our students right and so this ties into I know people have watched in the past we've talked about the great game of education which is taking a slightly different approach tied into that now yeah it's probably going to change names you know we're still there's still taking comments for mm -hmm. another couple weeks so right. um, can't say that empowerment use exactly what it's going to be, but uh, I suspect it probably will be, mm -hmm. uh, rather than the great game. But we're, we're still going to stay focused on the metrics of, that we've learned, the scoreboards. Mm -hmm. But now we start creating scoreboards for learning experiences. So the ultimate goal is for students to graduate and be successful, and that's tying right into that. Exactly right. We, you know, last year we went through part of the um, uh, the HLC process was a strategic plan and review the strategic plan, and when I, our board and the, and again the faculty, staff, and students were all involved um, to create even a new mission statement, which really focuses right. on educate and graduate knowledgeable, responsible, successful global citizens. That's our mission. Um, so it would. The only goal number one mm -hmm. is to work on retention and graduation and helping right. students persist. I want to thank everyone who visited the studio for Newsmakers Interviews this past year. I also want to thank you, the viewers, for watching the programs. And I want to thank the students and staff who work behind the scenes to record and air these programs. I'm Judy Stiles. Join me again next week as we begin our look at Newsmakers in 2020.